Hey, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu, everybody. So nice to have you all joining us for this um, webinar. We're very excited to learn from our esteemed panelists about an exciting new um, opportunity and resource for Islamic school educators, youth workers, whether you teach Islamic studies or science or you're interested in providing a um, elective course for your students, I think you will find this conversation extremely enriching. So we really appreciate all of our participants joining us along with our esteemed panelists. Jazakum Allah khairan. My name is Shaza Khan. I am the executive director of the Islamic Schools League of America. We are a nonprofit that support full-time Islamic schools. There's approximately 300 full-time Islamic schools here in the United States where we are centered. We know that we have people joining from across the um, world, including our panelists today. Um, ISLA's work is mainly focused on full-time Islamic schools here in the US, where we estimate there's approximately 300 of our schools, more popping up and, and being established across the country um, every year, mashallah. We estimate that our schools serve approximately 60 to 70,000 full-time um, students, K through 12. And um, ISLA as an organization networks approximately 5,000 um, educators in these schools. We focus on research, resources, and relationships. And this project, as you'll be learning about, really is a beautiful um, example of, of one of the kinds of initiatives that we love to be part of. However, this is not our initiative. This is something that has been led by the Initiative on Islam and Medicine. You'll be hearing from the PI, Dr. Asim Padella, um, later on in this webinar. The Initiative on Islam and Medicine is a leading research center at the intersection of Islam and biomedicine. IINM produces groundbreaking scholarship that impacts the lives of Muslim patients, healthcare providers, and religious leaders using an innovative approach that draws insights from a diverse set of disciplinary experts from across the theological, social, and biomedical sciences. And again, you'll see how that comes to life through this project, inshallah. As a platform for impactful research, tailored education, and creative dialogue, IINM's focus on improving is on improving the health of American Muslims and developing an academic multidisciplinary field of Islamic bioethics. We're going to get right into our um, webinar. Mashallah, we have many other partnering organizations as well. I'm going to leave this slide up for you to take a look at the amazing partners. I, I will call out one other um, organization here, which is HQEC, High Quality Educational Consultants, um, led by Brother Habib Qadri, many of whom you know, who have been instrumental in designing um, the curriculum materials that you'll be hearing about. And you'll be hearing from one of their consultant, Sister Aisha. And in fact, she is the first uh, panelist on this webinar. We're going to get right in. Uh, I'd like to just share a little bit of housekeeping before we get into that, is that um, each, panel, each panelist will speak and respond to um, a question that I'll pose to them to help um, you learn as participants more about this project and uh, as well as just to come away with a better grounding of what are some of the challenges in um, our Islamic schools related to teaching Islam and bioscience or teaching bioscience from within a non-Islamic lens and inshallah presenting a beautiful alternative um, and possibility for you all. So each panelist will speak for approximately 10 minutes and at the end we'll uh, have about 10 to 15 minutes for question and answer. I do invite any participant who's joining to ask questions in the chat as you come up with them, as you think of them. And if time allows, I'll ask them uh, to, the part, to the panelists while we're uh, speaking. And also I'd like to point out that Dr. Roda will be sharing a link in the chat. We invite you all to please fill out this form so that we can send you a certificate of participation as well as learn where all of you as participants are joining in from what your role is at your um, respective institutions and which institutions you are representing. So thank you all for being here and we'll get right in. 
Um, we'll start with Sister Aisha Bassett. Aisha is a seasoned educator with experience teaching students grades five through 12. She has her bachelor's in education and biology and has been a teacher for 19 years. She's taught high school honors and AP biology. She has teaching experience in public schools and Islamic schools, as well as homeschooling. Sister Aisha, as I mentioned, um, has served as a consultant with HQEC to help develop um, the Islam and bioscience curriculum. And she will be speaking to us about, and, and importantly, one other aspect of her bio that I do want to read from this is that she also has um, traditional Islamic education as well. She studied in an Alamiya program under traditional scholars in Chicago and online and abroad. So she brings um, vast experience both in Islamic schools and public schools. And Sister Aisha, given the experiences that you have almost two decades now teaching um, students, you know, from middle school to high school, what are some of the issues that you've seen related to teaching Islam and science to Muslim students? Can you share with us a little bit about the experiences and some of the challenges that you've seen students um, kind of struggle with? Um, so to address the question, um, there are actually a variety of issues that um, teaching science to Muslim students can arise and predominantly originates from our view of science and how we see it as a completely secular and separate endeavor. Um, even in Islamic schools, we call math, science, language, arts, secular studies, versus the other classes are considered Islamic studies. So in this way, we've already clouded that notion that religion and science are complementary to one another. And not only that, but we put religion and science in completely different realms, right? Living in a secular society, we unfortunately have subtly adopted this view that secular sciences are perhaps more important or more reliable or quote unquote correct. And for us as Muslims, this is a very dangerous road to, to head um, and tread on. And we're actually really seeing the dangerous effects of this because we're witnessing significant youth uh, amongst the Muslim population that have perceived this conflict between, um, or perceived conflicts between Islam and scientific principles as a key reason for their um, disturbance feelings. And they see the natural world and scientific concepts as not aligning with their religious beliefs. And so um, this played a, a substantial role in their decision to either um, leave Islam or even have a varied view of their perception of religion. So as a Muslim biology teacher, um, who wanted to make sure that my students saw that intersect between Islam and bioscience, um, I've been searching for authentic resources to do effectively that, right? And I quickly saw that there, were, there wasn't any particular curriculum that addressed these conflicts in detail. Um, and I had to sift through a lot of material whether it was Islamic material, Islamic text, uh, scientific lectures um, and literature, educational materials. And it was a very cum cumbersome task because of the fact that I also had a syllabus to complete to by the end of the year. And so um, that was one of the biggest challenges that I faced was having authentic and appropriate resources readily available um, to me so that way I can effectively teach my students. Um, and in regards to Subject matter specifically, I think one of the biggest conflicts that many teachers face when it comes to teaching biology specifically uh, is the concept of evolution, right? And the origins of the universe. Now, particularly Darwinian evolution is obviously what is being taught uh, as a standard theory of evolution. And so for us, we uh, this theory is in conflict with our Islamic belief in certain aspects, right? And the most uh, very evident aspect is that fact that uh, Darwinian evolution, or what has later become neo-Darwinian evolution, talks about this concept of common descent and how human beings perhaps have evolved from non-human ancestors. And this goes very uh, clearly against our Islamic belief of special creation of Adam and Nahawar alayhi wa um, as the very first human beings, which is explicitly mentioned in the Quran and Hadith. And so to look at how our faith traditions handles this, um, and this is something that obviously 
was something that the literature was absent about, as in literature available for teachers. And so when we look at other faith traditions, they most of them had just shunned it, right? Considering it evolution, something that we need to stay away from. And so obviously as Muslims, that was not an approach that seemed very practical to us. And then um, I looked at a couple of uh, other resources, which were which I found to be very useful, which were um, materials and videos and articles from a couple of da'is from the UK. And I found their resources to be very useful, um, very detailed, but again, it was not suited for pedagogy, right? It was not suited for us as teachers to be able to just take that information and implement it in the classroom. There was a lot of translating that needed to be done to bring it into the classroom and make it applicable. Um, and then the, another issue that I faced was trying to gather resources that were authentic um, and truly Islamic. And I remember facing uh, one issue where I found an article that was very clear, very detailed. I want to say it was like 30 pages long. And after about 20 pages in, after this great detailed explanation, it came to the discussion of human creation. And the author wrote, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after creating the heavens and the earth, six days, everything that we've been taught in Islamic studies, it came to the point where it mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala watched these animals and observed how nature dealt with them and then learned how to then create human beings in the best form. Na'udhu billah. So it shocked me to read such, such an article that started off great. But then came to a point where you don't have to be a scholar to realize this is going against the very essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being al-alim, being al-haqim. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa doesn't need to learn or study anything. He knows everything, past, present, and future. And so to see this kind of information being even out there was very shocking and, and uh, kind of put me aback to say that there needs to be some uh, authentic information as well as a place that we can go, right? Um, and so again, continuing on that search for more material, I actually came to, and again, searching for that authenticity, to an Islamic learning platform called al Balagh Academy. And so they offered a course called the Fiqh of Medicine. And I was very happy and excited to take this course, took the course, and mashallah, they discussed a lot of contentious topics that related to science, biology, medicine, um, and explained how to approach it from an Islamic lens and what the parameters should be, things that Muslims need to be aware of when embarking on this knowledge um, and these fields. But it was designed and intended for medical professionals, right? And so still, again, and there was a lot of it, since it was not tailored to pedagogy, there was a lot of translation that needed to happen in between um, of trying to tackle how do I bring this more sophisticated information into the classroom appropriate for high school students. And then stepped in the Exploring Bioscience and Islam curriculum. So I'll leave it there. Sure, mashallah, Aisha, you've highlighted some of the challenges that you as a teacher have also faced um, in trying to stay true, of course, as a Muslim educator to the Islamic aqidah and everything that we know about um, Allah and what we know about creation, but having a lack of resources available to be able to teach about this um, in a way. I really like what you said about you know, one approach that has been taken by Muslims is to avoid, you know, evolution and seeing it as evolution, but not being able to offer an approach that is grounded authentically in Islam. So, um, you know, and this has led to a lot of questions for our own students. And sometimes as they reach into the medical profession um, or any other profession related to biosciences, that they just kind of don't know what to do with that. And we'll get to that as well. Um, but we're going to move to the next um, speaker and panelist who's going to share with us a little bit more about the epistem epistemic foundations of um, Islamic epistemology and how that juxtaposes with what Aisha, as you talked about it, you know, the secular and Islamic bifurcation. And, um, you know, if we can 
just talk about and explore that. And Dr. Omar, we look forward to hearing from you. I'd like to just share a little bit about your background before I pass the microphone over to you. Dr. Omar Qureshi is a lecturer in Western and Islamic philosophy and serves as the head of the Diploma in Contextual Islamic Sciences and Leadership at Cambridge Muslim College. He has his Bachelor of Arts in Microbiology and MED in Curriculum and Instruction Science Education. He earned his PhD in Cultural and Educational Policy Studies from Loyola University in Chicago, uh, where he explored the topic of educational institutional identity in the U.S. Dr. Qureshi has led educational institutions here in the U.S. as well. Um, he was most recently provost at Zaytuna College in, um, in California, and he was also a principal in a large Islamic, full-time Islamic school in, the, in, in Chicagoland areas. Dr. Qureshi has also studied various subjects, including uh, Islamic law, Kalam theology, Islamic philosophy, Islamic legal theory, Quranic sciences, Hadith, prophetic biography, and Islamic history. So uh, Dr. Qureshi brings a lot uh, to the conversation. We're really excited and, and uh, honored to have you joining us. Uh, Dr. Qureshi, just to restate the question, what makes the Islamic lens unique or different from other lenses typically used in high schools today to study science? And um, just to also throw in there that it's your ex it's, it's partially your expertise along with many of the other scholars who are part of this project who then bring this into the Islamic, um, uh, the, the curriculum that we'll be sharing with you inshallah at the end of this session. Dr. Qureshi? Right. Uh... Uh, thank you Shaja, for that um for introduction and for arranging all of this uh I think it's a it's 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 a great opportunity um for many uh people across the globe I'm here in Cambridge UK <laughs> to uh to participate and to talk about some of the great things in uh, science education as it relates to Islamic schools so uh Zach Malfaden for us uh, setting all this up into all the organizers. Uh, what I can share very briefly is one is, what is the context in which we are uh, Islamic schools in the United States or in the West or you know, Anglophone countries um, are, uh, we're teaching in, right? Um, we're not, uh, we're teaching in a, uh, in a civilization where there's a lot of history and it's not a, uh, a with, and that history contains a lot of positions regarding religion and science. And um, so I'll share a little bit about that, then get into what are some essential elements of uh, of our uh, epistemology. Um, epistemology is just a big word for meaning uh, uh, what uh, what are topics of knowledge? What is knowledge? How do we know? what we know, um, what are our sources of knowledge. And so that's all epistemology refers to questions like that. And then kind of one major finding that I think is important for um, us as Muslims in general, but in particular Muslim science teachers and students of science, uh, which is a relationship between uh, science and religion as we see it from our Islamic intellectual and theological tradition. So, first of all, you know we're you know we're teaching in Anglophone countries, and um, there's a big history of the relationship between science and religion. And so, all the curriculum that we are using in our Islamic schools are informed by this historical relationship of science and religion, um, because they're designed by people who belong to the civilization. It's very natural. It's so, what else would we want to expect? Uh, however, as Muslims, we should be aware of this, you know, like who is designing this curriculum, what are their um, contingencies that uh, that uh, formed their views of science and religion, um, and then uh, what are their, you know, theological, metaphysical uh, commitments, epistemological commitments that they themselves have when designing this curriculum. That's one thing as educators and administrators uh, of Islamic schools, we should be asking those questions, right? Because uh, nothing's really neutral in that sense, right? Uh, everybody has commitments, and so um, including scientists, and, uh, and and this is a question that we should be asking as we adopt not just science curriculums, although that's our topic of conversation today, but social studies, uh, psychology, economics, um, you know, you name it, right? Uh, different subjects. So in the West, you know, basically what we're looking at, Ian Barbour has 
he's kind of famous for, uh, although it's a controversial position that he has, but he basically has conceived of a taxonomy of the relationship between science and religion. He says either they, he holds people who, you know, science and religion are held to be what he calls a conflict model uh, or a model of independence, a model of dialogue or a model of integration. In the conflict model, this model holds that science and religion are going to be perpetually and in principle in conflict with each other. Right, it's just looking at how, you know, primarily the trial of Galileo um, and also the reception of Darwinism as well. And so, um, you know, this is one model and one way how uh, people view science and religion. They're just, they're, they're independent ways of knowing and they're always going to be in conflict with each other. And um, this is informed a lot by the Protestant uh, tradition as well. Uh, and how they responded to science. Uh, there, then you have the independence model, and this holds that science and religion, um, they uh, they explore separate domains and they ask different questions. This is most uh, famously developed by Stephen Jay Gould, um, who developed this idea of NOMA, N-O-M-A, the non, uh, principle of non-overlapping magisteria. Science is a magisteria. And it's independent than religion, and they uh, they uh, they ask and seek to answer a different set of questions, and um, none uh, have to be in conflict with the, with each other. They're just separate. That's one way of uh, another way of how people look at the relationship between science and religion. The third way is a dialogue model, according to Barbour. And here, you know what we have here is that you know science can contribute right, to uh, theological questions. Likewise, the theology, you know, theological positions can also uh, contribute to or uh, to scientific uh, inquiries as well. And so this is um, held by people like uh, Alistair McGrath, for example, in the UK. And uh, he holds this method that even though they're different methods, scientists and theologians uh, use. However, they can be in dialogue, dialogue with each other. And then the final model that's used by Barbour is the integration model. And this is uh, more uh, extensive than this, you know, than uh, its unification of science and theology. Here, there's different ways of integrating um, both and um, of science and theology. And uh, he goes on in, into de uh, detailing these. Now, you know, so th these are the models, and this and, and it's kind of uh, that inform, by and large, the culture in which we are, you know, our, our education, our science education is taking place as Muslims, right? We also have to add in how Muslims have uh, historically uh, looked at science and religion as well, and we have, you know, a fourteen hundred year history, and uh, that's that, that's quite a uh, endeavor to even you know, come to terms with that and to understand that. But that's work that needs to be done. And there's some good research on that that's starting to uh, surface at this point in time. So what is it then uh, about, uh, what can I share that's distinctive about uh, an Islamic epistemology or uh, and what are Islam uh, what are the ways of knowing that we find in the Islamic tradition? Well, briefly, I, I will uh, uh, you know I, I will state that we have uh, this is a large topic, and of course, hopefully, uh, it'll be in the chapter of the book uh, as well, so one can find details there. But for the purposes of our presentation today, one of the things that we commit to is um, first principles, right? And these are well, the first principles of rational thought. Uh, they stem from one major principle, which is the principle of non-contradiction. In Arabic, it's called Mabda'u Adamu Tanaqid. And what we hold there is that from this principle of non-contradiction, basically it's it states in a very crude way is that you cannot affirm uh, something and negate something of the same object, uh, you know, in the same way, time, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. They have conditions for it. And from this principle of non-contradiction uh, arise the principle of the excluded middle and also the principle of identity. Um, so these are very important principles of Muslim thought that we all commit to and we see are actually part of human uh, fitra, actually. These are constitutive of, of human nature. Um, these The principle of non-contradiction may seem pretty simple. However, it's not something that is being acknowledged today, you know, uh, by many people is being challenged 
and uh, there are different ways and different um, uh, epistemologies that are being advocated, um, you know, in 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 the culture that we're we're teaching in. And so we have to understand, and scientists themselves are dealing with some of these challenges as well. You know, we do affirm sources of knowledge that are very common uh, that Muslims affirm, such as, you know, the intellect or, the, or, or uh, you know, can is a source of knowledge. Our five senses are sources of knowledge. Also, uh, true reports, testimonial knowledge. You know, most of our knowledge that we have is, is based on testimony. Um, and also intuition, ilham, these are all sources of knowledge. So... These are some of the fundamental aspects of the Islamic um, epistemological framework. And um, they inform also uh, when Muslim scientists conduct um, their investigations and their inquiries, they commit to the same framework. And so this is something that's unique and should be informing our uh, education, right, into uh, what, uh, in, in, in our science classes. And this is part of a larger project, too, which is we should be looking into the history and philosophy of science and how that should be reintroduced into the classrooms um, from K through 12, actually. And so because that's missing a lot from, you know, science education in the United States in particular. And most students, they'll study just scientific facts. They'll study a very crude model of scientific reasoning and the scientific method that's rarely ever used, actually, <laughs> you know, in, in real life. And so uh, introducing the philosophical aspects of scientific inquiry and the historical aspects of scientific inquiry is something very important that even non-Muslim science educators are uh, encouraging and advocating. And finally, I'll leave with the third point, uh, which is a very important finding for Muslims uh, in particular, is that this, this um, trope of a conflict between science and religion um, you know, when a, when a Muslim understands and they understand their epistemological commitments, they will understand this trope is basically a fiction, right? We do not hold that uh, there is a conflict between science and religion. Uh, in fact, if there is ever a conflict, it's between knowledge that is conclusive, right, and knowledge that is uh, inconclusive or probabilistic knowledge, Dhani knowledge. And the, uh, in fact, our scholars will maintain any proposition that is conclusive, we, uh, uh, that is rationally conclusive, is never, ever in conflict with uh, a proposition that is conclusive um, from, from uh, transmitted sources or revelation. And so Muslims never saw this conflict between um, religion and science. This is something that uh, I think we need to be aware of, and we need to see why they never saw this uh, conflict. And it's something that is, I would say, in many ways uh, unique to the Western experience rather than uh, our experience. And so uh, that's an important finding that, you know, and, and I think this will relieve anxiety of Muslim teachers and Muslim students. And hopefully in this chapter, we'll give them principles about how to navigate when there is a conflict between certain propositions of knowledge. That's really what it is. Um, not uh, th there can and uh, not between science and religion. I think this framework really, really need to kind of exercise from our, uh, you know, our our mindsets, and uh, inshallah, that'll relieve a lot of anxiety from us too. And we can approach these issues in a very calm uh, manner, hopefully. So I'll end with that, and uh, ho hopefully that. And I know it's ten minutes, so I'll try to stay within the timeline. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Qureshi. Really fascinating. And I think, um, like you said, relieving to learn that this is not a conflict that is indigenous to our tradition and that we need to, inshallah, as we're hearing a lot of people talk about, decolonize our education and come back to our Islamic um, you know, tradition, inshallah, which is so rich and hasn't seen that conflict that I think many students coming out of Islamic schools today believe is just a reality, right? That, that this isn't even a concept. This isn't even something that's discussed. It's just, hey, we're in science class, like Aisha talked about. These are the secular classes. We're not going to talk about Islam right now. We're just going to go in and read this textbook and learn it. I'm not trying to undermine what our teachers are doing to bring it to life. Um, but that concept of helping us understand where our, I love, you know, this notion for many of us new for us to understand epistemological commitments, right? What are our epistemological commitments? And 
I think another question that some people might have is, well, is this like way too philosophical for high schoolers to be learning about? You know, many of us haven't considered what our epistemological um, commitments are. So I think that what's really exciting for those of you who have just joined is that there has been a huge effort put in by scholars from around the world to really do a lot of this hard work to uncover, to draw into the expertise that they all have to come together as a team to provide us as Islamic school educators in high schools and even those in colleges to explore bioscience and Islam from, with, from an Islamic lens. So I'm really excited about our next speaker um, who will be sharing with us a little bit more about this project. He is in fact, the principal investigator. And um, can I say that this is your brainchild as well, Dr. Um, Asim, I, of course, with a wonderful team that you have and that you put together, mashallah. Um, and there are there is there are resources now, inshallah, available for our schools and for Muslim educators who have these epistemic commitments, inshallah, and want to maintain that Islamic lens and help their children and their students um, understand bioscience from within an Islamic lens. So. Before I pass the microphone over to Dr. Atham, I'd like to share with you a little bit about him. Dr. Padella holds a MD from Weill Cornell Medical College and an MSc in healthcare research from the University of Michigan. He also holds a BS in biomedical engineering and a BA in classical Arabic from the University of Rochester. He completed his residency in emergency medicine at University of Rochester and a research fellowship at the University of Michigan and a Clinical Medical Ethics Fellowship at um, University of Chicago. Additionally, his academic training includes visiting fellowships at the Oxford Center for Islamic Studies and the International Institute for Islamic Thought. He's authored, mashallah, over 120 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, and is an editor, co-editor of three books, including Medicine and Sharia, Islam and Biomedicine, Organ Donation in Islam, and another book, uh, Dr. Asin, that just came out last year about, or was it this year, about COVID-19 and Muslims. I might be getting the name, the title of that wrong. Um, and Dr. Asim, it has really brought together the field of Islamic, of ethics and medicine and um, is a practicing physician too, is the other point that I wanted to make. And so you have individuals who are committed Muslims joining us today and also working in the fields of bioscience and, and helping us really learn how uh, this can be something that our students can also inshallah do as they enter into the real world. Dr. Asim, um, you know, feel free to provide some more background as well, but the question that I'm really interested in hearing you address um, in particular is how does this project, the Exploring Bioscience in Islam Curriculum, a curriculum on the fundamental questions about the human being, address issues related to teaching Islam and bioscience described by our panelists, Sister Aisha and um, Dr. Qureshi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa rasulillah. Wa la alayhi wa sahbihi wa la barakallahu fikum, Dr. Shaza and my my colleagues here, Dr. Omar, uh, Sister Aisha, Dr. Hassan, you'll hear from uh, Isla and all the organizations. Uh, alhamdulillah, I see myself as, a, as trying to be a bridge builder and alhamdulillah, this is a project that, that comes from that sort of bridge building activity. Um, so may Allah put barakah in our time together and all of you who have joined so that we might leave with some something of benefit. Uh, so let me dive uh, to the modern context and answer your question kind of uh, the, about what are we doing about it, right? So the, I, I think the, the modern context or the present context is very clear in our communities. You know, Muslims are going into medicine. It is one of the professions that we all tell our children to go into all the time. And in the process of doing that, uh, we have a lot of Muslim physicians, alhamdulillah, both in the UK and the United States, so over 10%, nearly 10% of the physician population are Muslim physicians. Uh, you'll hear from another one after me later on. So mashallah, this, this is an amazing thing. But in the process of, of doctoring, uh, I might say that we are being indoctrinated in a certain way as well. Right, that 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 we take and consume knowledge, but rather we don't produce it or critically assess it. Uh, and, and to me, that context is what this curriculum is trying to address. Right, that that today's uh, science is a is the language of today's knowledge. Right, and we use it to aspire to solve many problems and to create a better future. 
And physicians do that as well, both in our communities, in our community roles, or in our professional roles. But it is not seen, science, and I'm using the, you know, the capital S here, is not seen as just an instrument of exploring the world or understanding. Rather, it's seen as the only way to do so, right? Uh, and I think that is the problem. So when we go into medicine and when we go into leadership and when we go into community spaces, uh, we think of it as science equals knowledge, right? As opposed to a way to gain knowledge, and that so I just want to set that's the, that's the context. The other context is that um, we are in uh, a post-truth world in liberal societies, where we all can hold on to whatever we want to believe and say this is what we believe and that's fine, right? Those meaning knowledge has become not just uh, uh, what science says, but then on the other side it becomes a feeling, right? I believe this, I hold this, and that's it. That's sufficient. Leave me alone, or you leave me alone, right? This manifests somewhat in, in in the religious discourse, right? That this is what I'm committed to, and as I'm committed to it because of a feeling, and that is not knowledge either. Knowledge requires thinking through things, investigating, exploring. It requires a process, an action. It's you know, it is not a just a feeling, an emotional state. And so the pushback on liberal society sometimes is you know, don't harm me, I don't harm you. This sort of notion comes from this idea that even knowledge just be feeling. Right. As you saw, we have facts and we have other facts or alternative facts. And that's another problem for us. And I think the Islamic schools are a site or should be a site, but we don't leave where we don't leave these two things to uh, occur. We don't have this notion of knowledge is just feeling and knowledge is only science. Rather, we want to have to create holistic human beings that can critically place knowledge from religious sciences, knowledge from the secular sciences. I don't like that division, uh, but nonetheless, from anywhere. They can critically place that knowledge and then use that knowledge for action purposes. Uh, at least that's what I think of Islamic schools. Um, and I hope that you all do as well. And for that, this is the this is a curriculum that's focusing on just one aspect, right, of bioscience. Again, because many, many of us might think of markers of success if our graduates from Islamic schools go into, phys uh, go into physicians' careers, but yet have you prepared them for that, right? So that's why the, 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 the curriculum is on the fundamental questions of the human being. I'm sitting at a medical school, I teach at the medical school, and nowhere in medicine do we actually talk about the human being. We talk about parts of the human being, but no one, not even first year, we talk about what the patient might be, we might talk about the disease or the organ state, but we don't talk about the composite being. What is the human being, right? Where did it come from? How was it, you know, what's its future? What is it composed of? What's what the constituents, what's its capacities? None of that is actually discussed because we know meaning those who put the curriculum that these are areas that there is uncertainty, there might be some conflict, right? And therefore, let's leave it aside. And I think that does injustice to those in medicine, but also to the broader society. So, so that, again, that's those are the questions that this curriculum addresses with the hope that it will prepare our students, meaning the Islamic school, high schools, all right, or the college, most of the college students, if they should pursue careers in biosciences, that they will have some sense of how, as Dr. Armour said, how to weigh evidences, how to think about knowledge as a, in a holistic schema. I mean, if we talk about Tawheed and have a Tawheedic paradigm, the knowledge cannot be, as he mentioned, conflicting, but rather it might be knowledge that is of different levels of certainty. So that's how the curriculum proceeds. So now specifically the curriculum, because I don't want, I want to leave less of my time for my colleagues here, you know, that our goal was to move people away from this necessity of a conflict thesis, which is what we hear outside all the time, in the newspapers, in the, in the in the media, right, or even our textbooks that we read, right. So that necessity of a conflict thesis between religion and science, we want to move students away from that, to be open then to the possibility for dialogue, as Professor Omar mentioned, or or integration perhaps, but to engage that with humility, both on the religious side and the scientific side, right. To really inculcate, you know, the IIMs, uh, we have this little thing called Hakim there. That's the right. That's the 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 icon, the word, the name that we, the the word, the attribute Allah SWT that we use in our in our iconography, because we want to have people to have hikmah, right? To put knowledge in the right place, to make claims in the right way, to understand, and then to be humble in all sides. So that was the goal of the curriculum, and address those five questions, as I mentioned. We want students to then think, gain conceptual and process knowledge of how to think about these things, whether those terms of as Sister Aisha mentioned, what is Darwinian evolution? What are the process of that? Okay, understand that. But then also, what are the what is the conceptual notion of knowledge, and what are the process for gaining knowledge from an Islamic epistemological sense? 
we want them to better understand the knowns and the unknowns about the human being, right? Where there is possibility for explaining further. We don't really know. Neither is the, the religious dictates fully clear, nor are the scientific understandings fully clear. So then you can then do research in these domains and bring those knowledges together. And then really to enter, if they should, biomedicine and biomedical careers, or generally speaking, even any scientific career, with a critical epistemic lens, right? To not take things necessarily at face value, um, but to investigate yours and mine, to interrogate that knowledge uh, for action purposes. Hope that suffices. Thank you so much, Dr. Asim. And inshallah, Sister Aisha will take us through some of the uh, curriculum units that are available for everyone um, to take a look at, inshallah, at the, um, after Dr. Asim speaks as well. But that really helps us understand the uh, background and the aims of developing this curriculum. And we're so grateful for the team that's put it together. And we hope that inshallah, the educators here will take time to take a look at that. Um, Dr. Asan is joining us um, as the Senior Vice President and Head of Oncology Department at Estella's Pharma. As Dr. Asan completed his medical training at Northwestern University, followed by a fellowship at Harvard with training in clinical epidemiology. Okay, now I'm not an educator, uh, a scientist. Epidemiology, had to learn that one during COVID. Under the guidance and leadership of Sheikh Mohammed Amin Khalwadiya, I'm going to butcher everything, Dr. Ahsan. Feel free to correct it when I'm done. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Ahsan leads a bioethics cohort at the Al Amin Ethics Institute. This visionary collaboration with Dar al Qasim seeks to cultivate moral and ethical excellence among Muslim professionals from the disciplines of healthcare, law, and information technology. Dr. Ahsan is also a um, has been working on this project and this curriculum with the rest of the speakers that you have heard from, as well as others. Inshallah, you can take a look at the website to see the bios of everybody involved in the project. Uh, Dr. Ahsan, can you talk to us a little bit about um, you know once somebody goes through a curriculum like this or, or goes through education? that provides an Islamic lens for understanding science and exploring science and bioscience in particular, what do we imagine are the real world and long-term impacts or what do we hope will be the real world and long-term impacts on students going through this curriculum? In other words, in what ways might being able to learn science through an Islamic lens impact students when they enter into the real world and are engaged in bioscience professions? Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulul Amin. And uh, just to echo what Dr. Asim and Sheikh Omar, um, uh, their gratitude and our gratitude for being able to share some insights uh, from this project uh, with your esteemed group of educators. Uh, uh, I, I think I'm always a little humble in front of a group of teachers and uh, always feeling like I'm a little late with my homework is Dr. Asim is probably wondering where my chapter is right now. So there's always that guilt element, which I'm sure you're engendering in your students as well. It's a positive part of being a good Muslim. Uh, what I wanted to share, maybe if I could start by addressing your question, um, uh, Shaza, with an anecdote. Um, and this is a, a story that just came up over this past weekend. Um, I had a young clinical investigator, a person who has gone through their medical training, a Muslim, very sincere person, has gone through their clinical training and wanted to talk to me because of my experience in the pharmaceutical industry. And this person has been in the pharmaceutical industry, a little bit more junior to myself, and just wanted to get to know me to have a conversation. And so we started talking about his background. He has a wonderful professional background, very thoughtful, very sharp scientist, very sharp clinician. And as we were talking, we talked about our career, we talked business, we talked shop, we had a very nice breakfast. And as we got to the end of our time, I kind of raised to him the question of some of the work that we're describing with you today. And as you're gonna hear from Sister Aisha in the curriculum and some of the work that we do at Dar al-Qasim and uh, what we're trying to engage in at the Alamein Ethics Institute. And uh, what this person shared with me was a very simple anecdote. And what he said was that, you know, for him, the intersection between religion and science came down to one story. And that story was that as he was growing up, he was taught that as a Muslim, you have to believe that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam split the moon, that the moon was split. And so as he was growing up and when the ulama heard that some scientists at NASA had found evidence on the moon of some cracks, they saw that as confirmation that the moon had been split. 
And so they kind of celebrated this, that science was affirming what we saw from Wahi. And then later, when that kind of got debunked, when scientists looked into this, and they had about 50 different explanations for why there might be these cracks in the moon, and none of them necessarily were evidence that the moon was ever split, then he found himself in this inherent conflict. That maybe what is going to happen to me if science debunks something that I as a Muslim have to believe in? And so his choice, and he described this to me, and he said, I've never said this out loud to anybody. And in our conversation, he said, you know, for me, I have mentally separated these two areas. So I have my Islam, that's what I practice, that's what I do in the masjid. But when I go to work as a cancer researcher, I'm thinking like a scientist and I keep that, I leave that behind. And I really don't want to because my fear is I don't want to lose my aqidah by engaging in science or looking at science as a means to inform my Islam and so on. So my simple answer to the question of what we hope this curriculum will do, and if you could imagine that many of your students probably will end up like this same investigator, um, this same young scientist. Um, I think the question or the challenge to educators in Islamic schools is, are these the students that you're producing? And if we are producing those students, how do we address that? So what we've tried to do in this curriculum is really to take a very different approach. And my, I think all of our intention that I've worked on this project is that through engaging in this curriculum, that students might understand this slightly differently. And it's not just an issue of potential conflict between religion and science, it's not independence, but there may be a third opportunity, and that is actually expansion and creativity that comes from a Muslim scientist, because the Muslim scientist is informed by Wahi in a way that a non-Muslim scientist is not. And because of that, the guidance that they are given in the pursuit of their science, that they would hope to actually produce better results that they would produce more benefit to human beings through that process. But the ethics, the morals, and the knowledge that come with being a Muslim actually expands their reach as a scientist. I think the other component for me, and Dr. Asim and I have lots of conversations about this, is we can laud the fact that we have thousands of physicians, we have thousands of Muslim scientists, I think we have to be very realistic about what is the impact of all of us, myself included, on the moving forward of our respective fields to bring benefit to human beings and to inform actually create creativity within science. And I think uh, raising that bar in the young Muslim student's mind that they have access to an entire world of knowledge that a non-Muslim scientist doesn't have. And with that knowledge, it can actually inform and inspire them to actually reach for something that maybe is not there. And a very simple example of that that often we talk about as physicians is in all of my medical training, all of my fellowship training, my day job, what I am told is that I am trying to seek a cure for cancer. That's what I do, that's my day job. But as a Muslim, what I understand is that Shifa only comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually in reality, what I'm trying to do is to develop means by which we attract Allah Shifa onto a patient. Now, that's a very different approach. It may sound, it, it may, it hopefully it doesn't sound subtle to anybody on this call, but that profound difference in how you view what you're trying to achieve as a scientist, as a Muslim scientist, really informs the way that you might approach it, the means through which you might approach this. And so when we're thinking about, and as we were developing this curriculum, really the idea is we wanted to provide some specific case examples for all of you to engage with your students in that, you know, maybe there's a different approach here. Maybe it's not this conflict between science and religion. Maybe it's nothing else, but maybe it's the idea that as Muslims, you should be inspired to be the best scientists, to have the best impact. Um, and again, this construct of, is, of, of Ihsan, of having excellence in the work that you do with the morals and the ethics, all of that informs the barakah with which you will execute your science and perhaps the outcome of that. What we often see is that science leads itself to quite evil ends now. And even where we claim to have some relatively pure intentions, the reality is we should be very clear and we want our students to be very critical in thinking about in an academic way, what are the reasons that we do research in the areas that we do? What are the avenues of research that are never undertaken because there isn't a financial uh, incentive to do it? 
Um, so really empowering our students to really think critically, use their minds. And then the last piece that I would share, and I think Sheikh Omar does a wonderful job of bringing this out, is the idea that we also believe that wahi can inform and enhance the uckle of the Muslim and enhance the empirical abilities of the Muslim. So we don't see these epistemological levels of knowledge as independent of one another. We actually see them as in, uh, in a very unified way of bringing these pieces together in the human being um, and to really bring every individual's potential forward by having them access all of that. So again, we think that this kind of a curriculum is just a starting point. The daily work that you all do with your students is really where this will be delivered. Uh, but really, that was a part of our intention for bringing this forward. And um, hopefully, we we're able to support you as you begin to implement this, inshallah. Thank you so much, Dr. Asan. So in a nutshell, this can transform the student and transform the field of bioscience, as well as humanity, as we put these Islamic principles as we put this Islamic lens at the foundation of everything our students are learning as it relates to science. Yeah. Yes. And hopefully transform a few teachers along the way as well. <laughs> We're always Inshallah. transformed by our students, aren't we? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Ahsan. That was really wonderful. Um, we want you to be able to see what this project, uh, what the curriculum materials look like, inshallah. So I will uh, refrain from talking too much and I'll let uh, Sister Aisha um, take about five to seven minutes to share that. I have some people who do have to leave at the top of the hour for any of our panelists who are able to stay on for another 10 minutes. I'd like to request um, that from you. And for anybody who has questions, please feel free to start dropping those in the chat, inshallah. I also wanna say before um, any of you have to drop off, that we will be hosting a workshop. So this is a webinar where we're really just trying to share with you some of the challenges, some of the opportunities, the thinking, the, the um, framework behind this exploring bioscience and Islam curriculum. Uh, but we also will be hosting a professional development workshop, inshallah, in the end of July, we'll be sharing out information about the specific date and time, which will be a lot more interactive for you will allow you to grapple with, actually look at, um, think about your own assumptions, your own epistemic commitments, and how those um, differ from or align with Islamic epistemological commitments, as well as the curriculum materials themselves. And inshallah, in the fall, we'll be hosting a professional learning community where we will help you and really um, work with you, inshallah, to implement this curriculum in your school. So you might uh, join it as you're implementing it and we'll meet live every week for six weeks to be able to provide that support. And all of us together, including you educators in the classroom, will be able to talk to each other and learn from each other about what's working, what's where are the struggles and stuff. But inshallah, I said I wasn't going to speak too much. So Sister Aisha, I do wanna give you that time inshallah to the top of the hour. Um, for those of you who have to leave, we will be sending this recording. So please do drop your questions in the chat if you have any, and inshallah, we'll stick along for another 10 minutes past the hour to address as many questions as we can, inshallah, in this time. Thank you so much. Please do fill out the form as well um, to receive a, participation, uh, a certificate of attendance. Sister Aisha, please um, share with us the curriculum materials, and we'll drop this link in the chat as well so that those who want to follow along can do so. Bismillah. Um, and for all of our esteemed scholars. And so just to kind of come back to some of the things that were echoed today. Um, number one, the concept of Ahsan. So hopefully, inshallah, this is the implementation of that Ahsan that we've tried to put to this curriculum together. And as you've heard from the scholars today, um, this is a curriculum of high caliber, right? We've had prestigious doctors and scholars working on this that you've got a glimpse of today. And so bringing that high caliber information now into the classroom was kind of the goal here. And so you'll see as we go through kind of just the website curriculum, these are the five fundamental questions that Dr. Asim was pointing out that really discuss um, who we are as human beings, right? Um, and makes this very practical. And so since this is 
um, addressing these questions in a very reflective manner, this allows the students to really engage with the material, right? Because it does become personal, um, as Dr. Asan showed that story as well, that these are things that students grapple with, right? We sometimes see them as children, um, where especially at the high school level, they're really capable of a lot more intellectual thought than we give them credit for. And so to appease that uh, curiosity and that creative nature, we wanted to make sure that that curriculum addresses all of those aspects of our students. Um, and so this is kind of the goals that um, Dr. Austin kind of touched upon, but really what we wanted to share with you is that this is not a tips and tricks to implement in the classroom. This is a full on curriculum in which it gives you kind of that uh, understanding of how to teach this information in the classroom. So to kind of give you an overarching uh, understanding, there are uh, six basic units in this curriculum. And the first being reasoning exercises in Islam and science, which is the epistemology uh, that Dr. Omar had begun speaking about. And then what is the origin of the human being? And then the third unit will be what is the essential nature of the human being. And so all of these, we are covering specific topics, right? So in the first unit, like I mentioned, was uh, epistemology. And that goes into like the judgment types, uh, empirical, rational, and revelatory. So students can discuss the spectrum of truth as our scholars mentioned, things that are qadari versus what is vanni, right? And then the various levels of, of one as well. And then unit two deals with uh, the tumultuous topic of evolution and starting off with discussing the Islamic narrative of creation and then goes into the science of evolution and really goes through the evidences and what we can accept and things that we need to reckon with. And then the third unit here will be discussing um, and tackling uh, aspects of the soul, right, and consciousness um, from a neuro neuroscientific perspective, as well as from an Islamic perspective, and even how artificial intelligence fits into the picture as well. Um, as we've seen on the rise of uh, this kind of being a very common uh, point of discussion nowadays. Unit four, what is its future, meaning the human being's future? Here we're discussing human enhancement and transhumanism. Um, we're, how are we changing the human being? Should we be changing the human being? And what does that look like, right? Um, especially compared to revelatory insights that we have. Um, as Dr. Hassan mentioned, uh, information that we have from Wahi, right? That we know is Qatari versus what our perspectives in science are. Units uh, six here, uh, sorry, unit five here, then talks about uh, the mind boggling question of the ages that are we programmed or do we have free will? And so here we are going to discuss um, view, the Islamic view on free will as well as uh, determinism and looked at it from a scientific perspective as well, like genetic determinism. And then lastly, we have the unit six, which is science and theological inquiry about extraterrestrial life, right? Usually, um, Right, we always have the picture of ET for those of us who are old enough to remember that. Um, but to understand that we as human beings have a uniqueness in the universe, and this gives us insight into how we look at pieces of evidence in science versus uh, on the Islamic side, how we dissect uh, pieces of evidence. Particularly, this unit will cover um, aspects of hadith criticism in order to examine that aspect. And then um, finally, in order to culminate all of these units and again, bring all of these points together so that way we see that relationship between all of these units, we have the ep epistemic framework. And in this epistemic framework, this is a application tool in which helps your students to review the material that was presented, um, as well as be able to connect all of those uh, points of reflection. So that way students are allowed to identify what are the uh, key take home points um, of this entire curriculum really enable students to see where there's that overlap between science and Islam. As uh, all of our scholars have mentioned that we don't want to have just this conflict model or independent model, right? We want that our students to really see that integration that, that happens, especially in the lens of Islam um, and interact with, with science. Um, and if all of that sounds 
amazing yet overwhelming. Uh, we already have put into place a lot of support resources um, that can be implemented as this curriculum is being carried out. Um, let me see here. So these were the units. And Sister Aisha, as you're um, taking us down the, the, the website that all of you can also check out right now, uh, Sister Iman, a principal in Florida, has asked, um, are the units aligned with the Common Core standards? Yes, so I was standards? going to let, try to see. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't have access to this material on this laptop. So, so in know. order to access the material, y'all, we'll just have to fill out this really simple form. Yeah. So let and, me mm -hmm. go through that just so that way you guys can see what that looks like. So pretty simple. And, you know, Iman, as she's doing that, there are many ways for this curriculum to be implemented in the schools. We've, um, Brother Habib, Sister Aisha, myself, and other um, members of this team have thought about it. We don't want to be directive about how you use it. Um, it could be an elective course. It could be something that's offered even at the weekend Islamic school. I think that Brother Habib's planning to do that over there. They have already or are teaching it currently at MCC Academy in Chicago um at the end of their school year so there's a lot of different ways that it can be incorporated into um the, the school schedule go ahead Aisha absolutely so just to kind of answer that question right there are for each unit you will see that there are accompanying accompanying um presentation slides as well as a video that has one of the instructors uh, presenting this information. And again, like I said, if it seems very overwhelming for teachers as well, there is a lot of supplementary material in order for you to not only assess your students, but activities to implement. So that way you're constantly getting that feedback that are my students understanding what more questions do they have? How can I address those questions? And uh, like I mentioned with these lessons, um, like the sister had asked that are these aligned with Common Core? They are actually aligned with uh, the next generation science standards as well as Common Core. So we've made sure that we made that they fulfilled the standards that are out there. Um, and so each lesson will have the content outcomes and any materials that you might need. And then the instructions are very scripted. So that way teachers of, of various levels and understanding can implement this with ease. And so we really thought of if perhaps teachers might not be educated in a lot of these things, right? I know artificial intelligence in, uh, is not my thing personally. And to be able to then teach that material, I need to be educated myself. So there's a lot of education for the teachers particularly so that way they can be prepared. And as I mentioned, these lessons are very scripted so that way it's very easy to implement. We really wanted to make this accessible and applicable in your classrooms. Um, and so since we've gone over the hour, I don't want to take too much time, um, but there's a lot of resources there, a lot of supplemental material. So that way, if there's more that needs to be discussed, um, that can be done if you feel that the students need more development. Um, and in fact, this is a lot of the presentation of contributions that have come from multiple sources of people um, and their fields of expertise. So like I mentioned, it's of high caliber. And now we've brought it and made it accessible for all of you as teachers into the classroom. Thank you so much, Aisha. Really appreciate you taking us through and showing us. I think that these um, having this actual visual and seeing what the resources are help people decide how quickly they can move into um, adopting it and taking it and using it in their own schools, inshallah. And, and it's already been taught um, here in the U.S. as well as in Malaysia um, and is being taught currently at MCC Academy. Inshallah, we look forward to providing a uh, professional development workshop where educators can really grapple with this the curriculum um, resources as well as just the frameworks that they enter into teaching science and, and Islam wherever this fits in in your schools. Um, so thank you so much, Aisha, for that. Any, do we have any other questions? I ask all of the presenters, panelists who are able to come back on camera, to join us back on camera. Thank you so much. Any other questions that folks have here uh, joining us? And we just have a few more minutes. 
there's a question about evolution, Dr. Omar. Uh, the, uh, the question was about uh, how do you tackle Darwinian evolution? Uh, and that we don't want to belabor that point. I know everybody can't comes in with this question. So, so the 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 panelist, the person asks, do you say Darwinian evolution is false? Do you use intelligent design, or do you talk about all other creatures evolve except Adam and Uh <laughs> So, Sheikh Omar, you want to talk about that very briefly? And don't let the cat out of the bag. They have to take the, to go through it. <laughs> very briefly is the challenge, I guess. Right. <laughs> uh, well, what I would say is. Uh, just uh, read the chapter in the book when, when it comes out. But even the chapter in the book um, uh, is, is you know, so anybody's teaching evolution knows it's a very complex theory, right? And um, there's many facets to the evolution. And, you know, it's also extended beyond biology to fields of psychology, uh, to the, you know, and to um, sociology as well. And so it's very... Um, it's a very vast, uh, you know, uh, yeah, theory. But you know, there's there's many parts of evolution that are, I mean, that that are empirical in nature. And as a Muslim, there's no way one should feel uncomfortable with those uh, empirical findings, right? And uh, those are things that one should, um, you know, be absolutely comfortable with. The question here is, again, using your epistemological framework. What's the difference between an empirical finding and an, an interpretation, right, of those empirical findings? So the issue really, I feel, that's up for, uh, that that really needs to be discussed when it comes to evolution um, is, uh, is making those type of distinctions. What are the empirical findings and not really having an issue with those empirical findings? So if they say, for example, a population uh, you know, uh, changes uh, its allele frequencies over time. That's an uh, empirical finding. There should be, you know, that 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 shouldn't be uh, causing cause of any concern. Um, I'll give you another example: the issue of morphological uh, similarities between um, uh, humans and other animals. This is something that Darwin did not introduce. This is something that it's an empirical. Uh, it's an empirical proposition. It's an empirical fact. Our scholars, in fact, um, have noticed and observed um, very common features between humans and chimpanzees, humans and apes. This is something over 500,000 years ago was known. It's not anything new. Uh, and, and, and not only physical or morphological similarities between humans and apes, but also psychological similarities, right? And also social similarities, right? Um, these were, and this is something not just Muslim scholars have observed. You know, uh, Christians have observed this. The Greeks have observed this. You know, the Taoists, uh, you know, have observed this. You know, it's in Japanese civilization. They've observed this. This is something known. Well, what's new that Darwin introduced? Well, what's new is the explanation. Why are these similarities observed? And here's something that's new. And for Darwin, Darwinian evolution, it's based on common ancestry, right? And so now is common ancestry in an empirical thesis? And in fact, it's not. It's not an empirical thesis. It's a philosophical thesis. And I think Sheza, you know, her comments early on was, uh, you know, were to the effect that do we have to learn, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, some ideas that are philosophical in nature, and the answer is absolutely yes. We just have to up our game, and this may be something new for Muslims in the West, but being philosophically grounded and be having philosophical sophistication and theological sophistication was never anything new for Muslims in all other parts of the world. We were an incredibly philosophical and intellectual, uh, you know, civilization. And so this will indeed require Muslim educators to increase their literacy of Islam, increase their literacy of, um, of science as well. So is Darwin evolution, uh, Darwin evolution false? It really depends on what you mean by that. And one cannot answer true or false to it. Parts of it are true, parts of it are questionable, parts of it are, are definitely false. Um, we have to really talk about. And also intelligent design, there's some, you know, again, we have to ask the same questions that we're asking of Darwinian evolution. Um, is there a design theory that Muslims have um, produced based on the Quran? And 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 absolutely, there's an incredible, you know, um, 
a contribution of, of, of a design theory. Um, however, there are some differences, you know. Um, so is the concept of irreducible complexity, is that found in Muslim uh, in, in Muslim writers and do Muslim theologians uh, observe that and have that concept? The answer is yes. They do find irreducibly complex structures in nature, right? Um, again, what does that mean? You know, uh, that's something there. Now, the chapter dealing with uh, part C of her question, um, the chapter that uh, Allah gives Tawfiq to finish, which is um, uh, on this uh, topic of evolution, we're not dealing with the entire gambit of the theory of evolution. Like I said, it's just way too much to deal with. And um, however, and specifically the issue of human origins, that uh, that will be looked at in the chapter, right? So again, the answer to that question is, um, you know, what I found uh, in our in our scholarly discourse, again, in our epistemology, uh, taking the uh, a fundamental aspect of our epistemology is, is is a source of our knowledge, a knowledge of certainty, is um, a consensus or ijma, consensus of scholars, and so there is in fact ijma consensus that I found that all human beings, all human beings that had that have ever existed, go back to saying that Adam salam, and he is the father. Uh, of all human beings. And so that has implications now on how we answer this question that you've asked, which is can, you know, um, some people are holding different opinions on that, but I think once you take into account from our epistemological point of view, the, the, the doctrine of Ijma or consensus of our scholars, that now, uh, that now um, impacts how we interpret the verses of the Quran, you see. So that'll that'll be addressed specifically in the chapter. So the chapter will deal with specifically human origins and the very questions that you the very question that you addressed. Um, I just given a summary of uh, of some of the key findings of that chapter. But hopefully that's uh, sufficient for this context. And, and Dr. Omar, just to clarify, uh, I think that this this is the case. But the book that's being linked here, Dr. Rauda has linked it, and Dr. Aslam shared the um, code. That is the book that you refer to. Okay, this is a different book. No, I suppose no. being being currently written. That's correct. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. So, so, so we I was referencing it. Inshallah, Tyler, what you have for uh on the on the website are teaching modules that Sister Aisha went through, and this is for you to use now. We hope to create a reference work, which is the book that Dr. Omar is mentioning, where we actually take you through some of these in a more deeper uh, philosophically engaged way or theologically engaged way. But that is still, inshallah, to make dua, it's still in production. We haven't gone there yet. So, And that'll complement these lessons. Yes. That are, that sure. It'll be like a, a resource for teachers. Exactly. These. So, mashallah, we're at the uh, end of this webinar. I wanted to ask um, Dr. Asim to conclude this webinar, inshallah, with any closing remarks that he might have um, as the person who has the scholar who has uh, really driven this project forward, mashallah. Um, Dr. Asim, would you mind just sharing some closing remarks, inshallah, and then um, Dr. Omar will ask you to conclude this session with dua, inshallah. Uh, so uh, alhamdulillah, as, as you've seen today, that there's, there's, there's been a, a attention to what the co present context is in our society in the Western society, but I would argue in the global society in the way this curriculum has come together. So, so I am I am grateful to all our partners and I'm grateful to all of you for coming together here to get a sense of what this is about. Uh, inshallah, ta the hope here, I, I want to underscore one thing. The hope here is that we uh, take the whole sense of the idea that they're ayats, right? The, the natural world and the Quran are both ayats indicating as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that we have a unity of notion of knowledge. And that is what we're trying to instill in some sort of way with some critical appraisal as of sciences, but it is something to be grappled with, to thought about. Uh, we are on a journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he tells us in the Quran, that he will show us the right the signs in the in the cosmos and amongst ourselves uh, so that we become sure that it is truth, that this Quran is truth. And so we do have that idea, but it is not apologetic. It is not just saying the Quran has all the answers, but rather in a more nuanced way as our theologians did so that it can stand and create stable identities within our students as they move forward into professional life and then become parents and teachers themselves, inshallah ta'ala. So that's my my hope. Please keep us in your du'as. 
uh, uh, and we look forward to, inshallah, engaging with you through Islam and others as well. And I'll let Sheikh Omar end. We are over time, so hold on, Habibi. I just want to say thank you to everybody, um, organizers, and uh, all the panelists as well. Jazakumullah khairan. Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi sallam ajma'in. Allahumma wa fikna li ma tuhibahu wa tarda wa ja'anna min abirika su'ada. Wa amitna ala kalimatul huda wa alimna ma yanfa'una wa wa fikna lil amali bima alamtana bih. وجعل ما نحن فيه خالصا نخلصا لوشك الكريم يا رب العالمين اللهم اجعل تجمعنا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا تفرقا معصوما شقيا لنا ولا محروما وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم اجمعين امين رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Thank you so much to all of the panelists um, for joining us. Inshallah we'll be sending out a recording to all of the registrants um, in the coming days. Thank you all. Feel free to send us your questions if you have any. Um, Dr. Roda, I wonder if you could also place your um, email address. Dr. Roda is the project coordinator here joining us. And um, I'll drop my email address as well. And pass along your questions if you have any to the appropriate people. Thank you so much. Take care. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Wa alaikum assalam.